But we're going to get this party started. Let me know if it starts getting wacky. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. That thing is, that thing is just, just right. It's just right. Rolling. Rolling. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning, Keith. There's more than three people here. Good morning, Good morning everybody. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. Nice. All right. So, with no further ado, let's bow our heads in prayer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, God, God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity, God, to study your word, the Bible. Father, we ask you for the power of, the, of your Holy Spirit to give us wisdom and discernment and understanding, God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so we got a lot going on here. we got a lot going on here. So the title of today's message is, Do You See the Vision? And if you can't hear me, Ask me and I will speak up. No problem. All right. So do you see the vision is the title of today's message. And I kind of played around with a whole bunch of message, uh, titles for this message because this title kind of fits the message. Okay. So just thought I put that out there. Two different titles I was working on. So so before before we even start going into the scriptures and to the, the whole thing behind today's message is... Um, there's a, there's a lot of things that, in the Bible, that are very clear and are non-debatable, all right? That man fell, Jesus is, is, our, is, our, is the way to God, right? He's the one that reinstates our relationship with God. We can only go to the Father through Jesus Christ. We can't work our way into salvation, that only through the blood of Christ can we, can we enter into eternal life, okay? These are all things that that are universal throughout the Bible, you can go right to it, and it's non-debatable. Now, there are other topics throughout the Word of God that are not as black and white, and many people will study these things and arrive at conclusions based off scriptures. Now, I have to remember, you know, in order to have a doctrine, you can't take one verse out of the Bible and base a whole doctrine around it. All right? You want to have... Two or more witnesses throughout the Bible, which means you want to be able to support what it is that you see in the Word of God with at least one other verse in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Now, some topics have multiple verses connected, and they go into multiple areas. And 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 listen, some people arrive at this conclusion, and some people arrive at a different conclusion. Now, who's right? I guess someday we'll find out. The point is, is that. If the Holy Spirit is convicting you and showing you this thing, and you believe it, and you decide to deny it, that's where we run into a problem. Everybody understand so far? Mm. All right, so today's topic is one of these things that some people see one way, some people see another way. So today we're going to dive into the scriptures, and we're going to try to get a better understanding of what we're looking at. So the expression, the title that I use, do you see the vision? You know, you ever have like an idea and you're trying to explain to somebody your idea and you're like, you know, and, you, and you're talking about it and you're like, do you see the vision? Do you see the vision? And you're asking that person if they're seeing what you're saying, yes? All right, let's go over to the, to the book of Matthew, chapter 17, uh, verse 1 through 9. And I did give that out, yes? Yep. Book of Matthew, chapter 17, 1 through 9. This is a... Uh, uh, story in the Bible of the transfiguration, it's called. <clears throat> and after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. Mm -hmm. and, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here, if thou wilt. Let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Mm -hmm. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face, 
and were sore afraid. And, and Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no men, save Jesus only. Mm -hmm. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying... Now listen up real quick. Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man. Tell the what? Vision. The vision. To no man. To no man. Until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. Amen. Notice what he said here. He said, tell the vision to no man. Mm. Okay? It was a transfiguration. We see Moses and Elijah uh, appear. Okay? Which is a sign of what? Does anybody know what that's a sign of? What's that symbolic of? It's a symbolic of the law and the prophets. Jesus came to bring in a new cup. Right? So Jesus was a picture of the new covenant, and we have the old covenant, the law and the prophets, which all pointed to Jesus. Okay, so notice what he said, the vision. Extract from this that we know that's 100% <laughs> is when God said, this is my beloved son, listen to him. Mm -hmm. Alright, that's a commandment from God, yes? Yeah. Alright, so notice how it says the vision. The vision here. We're going to go over to the book of Acts chapter 9, and I got, I got these verses. The <coughs> lighting is terrible. Uh, Acts chapter 9. Let's see here. We're going to be in verse 10 through 16. And it says here, And there was a certain disciple at Damascus. Everyone knows the story of, of Saul to Paul. Saul was stricken down. Saul was out running around. He was, he was a Jew. He was a religious Jew. The Bible talks about he's a Hebrew of Hebrews. And, and at the time, Christianity had just been beginning. And Saul was out to wipe out Christianity. Off the face of the earth. Okay? And he was persecuting Christians. And at one point, Jesus knocked him down on the road to Damascus. And when he knocked him down, he said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And at that point, Saul realized what he was doing. Because he realized he just ran into the Messiah. And he said, Lord, what will you have me do? And at that point, his vision was taken. And he was without his vision for three days, okay? So I just want to give a little background just to show where we're at right now. So, again, verse 10 says this. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him, the Lord in a vision. In a what? In a vision. In a vision. Ananias. This is the, that's the voice of the Lord. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayed. And he had seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Notice that Paul saw in a what? Vision. vision. In a vision that Ananias was going to come in and restore his sight, yes? Yeah. So this was a vision inside of Paul's head. All right, and then... We'll just keep reading the rest of this here. And then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much of the evil he had done to the saints of Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is, cho he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will shew him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So you see here that, that Paul, Saul was called by Jesus Christ. Now the reason that we're, we're, we're focusing in on the visions, because a vision isn't always an actual thing that's happening, yes? It just means you're seeing something. So the reason that we're talking about this is because there is a, a lot to talk about when it comes to examining what happens when people pass away. All right? there's, a, there's a lot in scripture about what happens when we die. And some will say, well, when we die, we're up in heaven automatically. Yeah. If, we're right, if we're right with God and right with Jesus Christ. And then they reference to this verse and they say, well, then how did Moses and Elijah appear with Jesus Christ mm -hmm. if they're not in heaven? But we have to look at the language. And the word vision that's here is the same word translated that we also read that, that, that God gave us in Acts chapter 9. It's a vision. So the same word vision appears again, and Paul had a vision. 
He was blind. He definitely didn't see Ananias coming in, yes? He saw him afterwards, but he didn't see him before that happened. Okay? So we're going to be examining this today and see what we're looking at. Some people believe that it's heaven or it's the other place. What's the other place? Uh, yeah. Hell. And what's hell look like? Earth. Hot torment. Earth. Hot torment. Fire. Fire, Fire, right? That's the main ingredient in hell. So right now, there's a place deep in the earth somewhere where it's just burning. All right. This is what some folks think, and we're going to examine it, like I said, today. All right? So let's go over to Matthew chapter 27, verse 50 through 52. <clears throat> Matthew 27, verse 50 through 52. And there's a reason that we're looking at this today. It's not just for an extracurriculum activity. There's a reason for it. We're going to tie it in at the end. <coughs> Matthew chapter 27. Yep. 50, verse 50 and 52. Then stay in Matthew, okay? Uh -huh. I agree. If this thing is... Shut the water off. Just 52? 50 through 52, please. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice. Talking about the crucifixion, everybody. Okay? Mm -hmm. This is Jesus Christ up on the cross, taking his last breath. <laughs> yielded up the ghost. He did what? Yielded up the ghost. Jesus yielded up the ghost. Now, everyone knows the story Jesus Christ on the cross, yes? Now look at as he took his last breath, it said, then he yielded up the ghost. Let me ask you a question. Did Jesus go right up to heaven at that moment? No. He didn't. No. Right? The scripture tells us. He was taken down, and he was brought into the sepulchre. And they rolled a big stone in front of it. Everybody remember the story? Mm -hmm. And he stayed there from the Passover through the Sabbath into Sunday. And what happened on Sunday? What did he do? Resurrected. He resurrected. Let's go over to Matthew 28, verse 1 through 6, just so we can read it in the scripture. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the uh, sepulchre, sepulcher, which is a grave. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. Mm. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, mm -hmm. Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord led. Amen. He is risen. Thank God for that, huh, family? Mm -hmm. God. Thank God for that. Let's go over to Job chapter 14, verse 10 through 12. Job 14, verse 10 through 12. You know, sometimes when we get fancy someday, family, we'll have like the <laughs> scriptures up on the board here. But what happens to me is when... I'm in church, and they got the scriptures up on the board, like the pastor will say it, and then kind of cruise by it, so I'm trying to hear the pastor and read the thing. At the same time, I get lost, because then the pastor jumps on, it's not all pastors, but I'm just saying, it happens to me anyways. Maybe I have a hard time paying attention. So this is, there's a delay of game sometimes, and we're looking up these scriptures, but, but we get right to it, and there's no distraction. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, Job chapter 10. But they have died. And we in the way. Yes. You know. <coughs> yo, you man, give it up the good. Give it up the ghost. And so man, so hold on. Start from the top there. Man dieth and what? Wasteth. And wasteth away. So that means when they die, the body does what? Wasteth away. Yeah, decomposes. Decomposes. Yeah. yeah. Turns back into the into the earth. Yes. All right, and then so keep going. Wastes away, and man giveth 
up the ghost. And, and when giveth Mary, up the ghost, here's, the, here's that saying again, he gave up the ghost. And where is he? And where is he? Here's the question. So he gave up the ghost, the man's dying, wasting away, gave up the ghost, and where is he? As, Tell us where he is, Jeff. As he walked, as the waters fill from the bed. I can't even see this. Game. It's too dark down here. Yeah. Let me see it. Not that I got any better vision than you guys. All right. Yeah, the, oh, this is wicked small, man. Yeah, that's that's the problem. Right. All right. As the waters fall from the sea and the flood decayeth and dryeth up, so a man lieth down and riseth not till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake, nor be raised out of their sleep. Out of their what? Sleep. And where are they? They're in the ground. Until when? Did, the, did it just say? Till the heavens be no more. Till the heavens be no more. They're there. All right? So let's, uh, let's take a look. This is the language where it's talking about gave up the ghost, yielded the ghost, right? We know that Jesus stayed there, right? He went into the grave, and then he resurrected. Now, Job just said the person died, the body wasted away, they gave up the ghost. So, the way I see this is that the ghost is referenced to life. They gave up their life. Their life is gone. They're no longer living the carnal life that we understand here. And I also put that together, if you will, with Acts chapter 7, verse 14. that shows another reference. Because some will say, no, you die, and the soul leaves the body and goes up to the Lord. People have heard this. Mm -hmm. The person dies and the soul goes up. Okay, let's take a look at, at Acts chapter 7, verse 14. Then said Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred, three score and fifteen souls. Mm-hmm. So, just so I, if anyone doesn't know the story here, I'm not going to go in depth. It's cold now, man. Huh? Yeah, yeah. My goodness. We can turn that heat up a little. It's on the other side, Tyler, right? Right here. On the other side of that beam. Thank you. Turn it on. And then mm -hmm. turn it up. It says 80. No, you want me to put it on 80? Negative. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just messing with you. So, we got I know ceiling how you coming down on us and everything else. But we do have heat. So, so we see here, so Joseph... Long story, we're not going to get into it, but at this point, Joseph, Joseph is in Egypt. His brothers come back. He forgives them, and he says, go get my father. And the family's deep, okay? Three score, when the Bible says score, it means 20. All right, so three score and 15 souls. How many people came? 75. Over to Egypt, 75. There you go. We got a mathematician here. 75 <laughs> people came over. <laughs> 75 people came over to Egypt. Now, if everyone knows the story, Joseph got some political power in Egypt at the time and brought his whole family in. And they multiplied and they multiplied. And the Pharaoh that really liked Joseph died. And the new Pharaoh came onto the scene and was like, uh-uh, we got too many Jews running around this piece. And they enslaved them. Okay. Just to give you a little background, I'm not going to go on and on throughout the story, but that's what happened. And then Moses showed up on the scene, and that's later on in the Bible. But the point is, is notice what it said, 15 souls. These weren't 15 dead people that ghosts that came with them, no. These are 15 people. The Bible referenced the living person as a soul, amen? amen. All right, let's go over to 1 Corinthians now. We're going to just fly through some verses. So we got... Whoever's got their, their, their verses ready? Yep. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. Yep. Then we're going right to Acts 26, 23, and right on down. But now is Christ <coughs> risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Amen. He became the what? First fruits. The first fruits of them that did what? Slept. They slept. Notice now. It just told us that Jesus is the first to be resurrected. He's the first person that has died and been resurrected to heaven, not earth. Mm -hmm. All right, we need to understand this too. And I don't have all. I didn't. We're not gonna. We, we'd be here till a week later, right? If if we went through all these verses, but there is folks that have been resurrected, physically resurrected when Christ was here. 
He resurrected them. They didn't go back up to heaven. They just lived again on earth. They died again and went back to sleep. Okay? We'll do that right at the end. So, Acts chapter 26, verse 23. That Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should shoot light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Amen. So this is a clarification that Christ is the first of the resurrection. Okay? And we just learned in the other verse of those that have slept. Those that fell asleep. Now look at the look at the language that we're using here. Let's go to Acts <coughs> chapter 7, verse 60. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice. You're going to want to speak very loud. All right, that's it. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice. Mm -hmm. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, <coughs> he fell asleep. He fell asleep. Now, it's a very sad story here. We're talking about Stephen. Stephen was a, a faithful... He, he was martyred, right? And he went in and he re rebuked the Jews and he, and, he, and he told them like all about themselves. He went from the beginning to the end and how they just killed the prophets and all this stuff. And those very people, they killed him. And as they were killing him, he prayed for their forgiveness. Think about that principle, right? He asked them like, and listen, he was stoned to death, right? So I'm not talking, they didn't make him smoke weed till he died. They picked up rocks and they smashed him with them. Okay, this is how they killed him. Can you imagine? Someone's picking up large rocks and they're just whipping them at you. Bones are breaking, chunks of flesh are coming off, and you're praying and saying, God, forgive them. Because they don't know what they're even doing. But notice what it said. He fell asleep. He fell asleep after that. Acts chapter 13, 35 through 37. Wherefore, he shall also in another song Thou shalt not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Mm -hmm. Now, hold on right there. When we're talking about corruption, we're going back to that word, that decomp... Uh, uh, I can't even say it now. Decomposure. Okay? So it's he, he's not going to decompose. His body will not decompose. It's talking about Jesus Christ. It says his body will not see corruption. If you look it up in the concordance, it says it's decomposing. His body is not going to decompose. Jesus' body did not decompose. Okay? He was resurrected on the Sunday. Keep going, please. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep. He fell on sleep. David died. King David. And what happened? And was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. He saw corruption. David's body decomposed. Jesus' body did it. David fell asleep, the Bible said, which means death, and his body saw corruption. All right, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. This is, a, this is an area where the people are complaining in this, in this particular verse that we're going to look at, and they're like, where's God? They're like, since forever, you guys have been talking about God's coming back. Where is he? Who has uh, 2 Peter? I do. Oh, okay. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. That's Second Peter 3, 4? Oh, no, that's Thessalonians. Okay. Uh-oh. <laughs> that's all right. I'll go, I'm going to go there real quick, just so we can hear it. You got it? it. You got it? Okay. In saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Exactly. They're saying, listen, where is he? It's the same thing. Since the beginning of creation, the fathers fell asleep, and nothing's happened. He's talking about the, these, the, all these people died. And they're like, what happened? All these people have died, and Jesus isn't coming back. Let's say the explanation from Jesus Christ himself. Let's go to John uh, chapter 11. You over there, Mitch? No, I got it. John 11, 11 through 14. Yep. These things said he, and after that he sighed. S A I T H. What's that? Say? Sigh. Say. 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 Say unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go, that I may awake him out of sleep. Okay, so here what he just said Lazarus is sleeping. Jesus said, I'm going to go wake him up. Now let's get some more details. When he says, Wake him up, that means resurrect him. It's going to tell you. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. 
Howbeit Jesus spake, spoke of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus, Lazarus is dead. Amen. So you see right there. They thought he was actually, they thought he fell asleep. Like, well, it'd be good if you're sleeping, right? <laughs> he's like, no, no, no. He's like, he died. And I'm going to resurrect him. So come on. Right? So, all right. A few more verses here to talk about this. So first, first Thessalonians uh, chapter 4. We're going to read verses 13, 14, and 15. This is a scripture that's often given if someone has passed away and people will, will share this. As believers, we should share this with each other for, for encouragement, right? For encouragement so we can know that those who have passed away in Christ, that we're going to see them again. This is a promise that's in the Bible. And so we just want to look at some of the language here that's used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. So when he says, I would not have you to be ignorant, he's just saying, I wouldn't want you to not know. Being ignorant just means you don't know. Concerning them which are asleep, mm -hmm. that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. Yes. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Amen. So we're not going to prevent them which are asleep. That means when Jesus comes back, and if you continue to read that chapter, it talks about Jesus coming back. Um, Revelations 1 7 says, Every eye will see him. So it will not be a secret family. When Christ returns, it's a one time event. Mm -hmm. It says, The trumpet of God will sound, A, in the voice of the archangel. This earth's going to shake when Jesus Christ comes back. And like I said, every eye will see him. And it says at that point that those that are alive right now that are Christ, when he returns on this earth, are not going to get in the way of the ones that have died. Those ones, the ones that have died in Jesus' name, are going to be resurrected up into the clouds. And then us that are left here on this earth are going to get brought up with them and forever be in the clouds is what the Bible says. Now if we turn over to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it's the little Bobby Brady thing there. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, sorry, and verse 6. We're going to get a little bit even more about this. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. Some are fallen asleep. And then we're going to jump down to verse 18. <coughs> verse 18, please. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Okay. Those that have fallen asleep in Christ are perished. We already read verse 20 um, a little while ago. But it just as a reminder, it says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and became the first fruits of them that slept. And then let's jump down the way to 51. Behold, I shew you in a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Amen. So Paul right there is talking about it because the, the person, the body that we have right now is going to get transformed when Jesus Christ comes back. When we resurrect or when we go to heaven when Jesus comes, this, this body that we have is going to be changed. It talks about we're going to be transformed into a different creature. Okay, But the point of all this is that the state of the dead. Now some people will say, well, what about in Samuel? Samuel, in the book of Samuel, there was a there was a calling up of a spirit. Yes? I don't know if you know the story or not, but Saul knew that he messed up with God, King Saul, and he was freaking out, and he cast out all the mediums and witches of the area, had them all wiped out, and there was this one that was still left, so, so he went into the skies to go to the medium, because he was scared to death, Samuel had died, the prophet Samuel died, and he went to this medium in disguise to have her communicate with Samuel. So let's go over there. Let's go to 1 Samuel 28, because this is another side of the argument. After those verses that we read, we come across some other verses like this, and we're like, well, wait a second. 
how are they asleep when this situation is going on? So 1 Samuel 28, and I don't think I gave it out, so I'll be the reader on this one, unless I did, but I don't think I did. All right, so 1 Samuel 28, and we're going to start in verse 8, and it says, And Saul disguised himself, and put on another raiment, and went, and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he had cut off those who had familiar spirits, and wizards, and of the land, Wherefore, <coughs> uh, wherefore they layest thou a snare for my life? Do thou do you cause me to die? So basically, like I said, he went up in the disguise, snuck in there, and she's like, "Listen, Saul's killing everyone that's doing this kind of stuff. Do you want me to die too?" So, anyways, it goes on. Says then the woman said, "Whom shall I bring up to thee?" And he said, "Bring me up Samuel." And when the woman saw Samuel. She cried with a loud voice, and the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me, for thou art Saul? So now she figures out that he's Saul. Now notice that she did say she saw Samuel. So that's an interesting part of this whole thing, right? But we want to keep reading here and take a look at something else. And the king said to her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, Saul now she's explaining what she saw. I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. Saul did what? Perceived. He perceived that it was Samuel. So whether or not now we're dealing with Samuel or not, we don't know. Okay? We know that there was a description by this, this woman explaining what she saw, an old man with a lantern, right? And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And now there's a dialogue that goes on between them, and we don't got to get into it because it's really not relevant to the whole thing, and we'll, we'll be here even longer, right? So basically what it is is Samuel's telling Saul, why, why did you bring me up here? It's, so whatever this was that came up, if it was Samuel or not, was like, why did you bring me up here? So the question is, right, who, who is Samuel? First off, let's go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32 and 35. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. Did I give that out? Because we want to we, we want to see what the Bible even says about Samuel. We know from the scriptures that Samuel was a prophet of God, right? Well, let's see let's see what the Bible even says in Hebrews in the New Testament. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets. And of Samuel. Now listen, now remember we did the Bible Hall of Fame a couple weeks ago. We talked about all the, all the great people of faith, men and women, and we went through all that. Well, this is that, this is that area. This is Hebrews chapter 11, and it's talking about what shall I say of all these people. Basically, he's like, I'd have to write, you know, four more books to include everybody. And one of the persons that, he, that he's talking about, a great person of faith that we should look for, to look to as an example, is Samuel. Okay? So Samuel's a great person of faith. Now, let's just say that the hell and the heaven thing is a legit thing. That the person does not die and go to sleep. That, in fact, there is a soul, a ghost, or whatever that does go to heaven or does go to hell. Why would Samuel be down there? That's the question. If, in fact, it was Samuel that the witch saw and she called him up, then why would he be getting called up? Wouldn't he be getting called down? Wouldn't Samuel be coming down from heaven if he's a great person of faith? Let's take a look over now um, to verse 35. What man received their dead raised to life again. Okay, women received their dead raised to life again. Remember we talked about the physical resurrections, yes? That's what this is talking about. Keep going. 
and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. Okay. That they might obtain a better resurrection. They might obtain a better what? Resurrection. A better resurrection. Samuel is one of the people that we're talking about. A better resurrection. Okay, not a resurrection just we have here you are, here's another shot at life on this earth. No, resurrection, resurrection. I'm talking about being up in heaven. So that's something that, that for us to kind of consider as we're considering what happens to people when they die. Let's go over to John chapter 5, verse 28 through 29. We just got a few more verses and then um, we'll be concluding today. And then I can tell you why we're reading all this stuff. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming into which all that are the graves shall hear his voice. Mm -hmm. And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Amen. So there's a time that's going to come where they're going to hear the voice, and there's going to be a resurrection, yes? Mm -hmm. And some people are going to be going to heaven, and some people are going to be going to damnation, is what it said. At when? The resurrection. Not now. Right? That's what it was saying. Let's go actually over to Revelation chapter 20, verse 5. I want you to, to think about something as we go to this verse in Revelation 20, right? Just uh, something to think about. So the word hell, when it's used in the Bible, is translated sometimes into Hades. But basically what it means is a grave. Okay? The word hell is grave. You go and look at coordinates into your Bible and you look the word up, it's going to show grave. Okay? It's a grave. So when they say, oh, he went to hell or he's in the depths of hell or whatever it is, possibly talking about a grave or a sepulchre. All right? That's just what I'm, this is, that's just how I'm looking at it. Now, let's go to Revelations 20, uh, 25. But when the rest of the dead live, not again, until the thousand years were finished, this is the first resurrection. Alright, so the first resurrection. Now let me not lose anybody. Remember what we talked about. Jesus comes back, every eye sees him. What happens? The dead in who rise first? The dead in Christ, the dead in Christ rise first. Then those that are Christ go with them. And they're in the clouds, yes? Then, then there's a period of a thousand years, it just told us. And that's the first resurrection. So for that thousand years, God's people are being taught. You know, we only use 10% of our minds right now. We'll be able to use our whole minds. And, and who knows what, what, what's going to go on, right? And so we'll be like Christ. The Bible says we'll be kings and priests. We're going to be judges. So in the second resurrection that it's talking about, we're going to be judging in the second resurrection, okay? But notice what it said. It said in verse 5, it said that the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. So everyone else that died not in Christ, they're not resurrected yet. And just another thing, too, that I want to mention, that it goes on to say in Revelation, that the dead in the second resurrection are judged according to their works. So it's not an automatic thing that, you know, the Bible's not, you know, the Bible's clear as far as, like, we need to have Jesus Christ and everything else. The second resurrection talks about the dead are judged according to their works. So there's an executed judgment at the end times. Okay? But anyways, we can go real far into that. So believe me, this, putting this message together, very difficult to not go into all these different corners because there's so many different things that you want to tie into it, right? So so anyways, we see that point right there. Let's go over to Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 9, verse 5. For the living know that they shall die. But the dead know not anything. The dead know what? Not anything. Okay. Neither have they had any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. So that's it. When you're dead, it's a wrap. There's no more. You can't change what you did. Right? There's nothing you can do about it. Whatever, whatever moves you made on this, on this life right now, it's over at that point when we die. Yes? But notice what it said. It said the dead know nothing. So there's not a place where the dead sit and they're going, you know, they don't know nothing. They're not, there's no place where the dead are thinking because they don't know anything. They're dead. They're asleep. So the other thing to think about, right, is 
Go here real quick. Revelation 20, uh, 14, 5. I'll read it. 14 and 15. Revelation 20, 14 and 15. It says, Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. <coughs> the lake of what? Fire. So y'all telling me there's a place right now that's burning, yes? It's on fire. Hell. And people being tormented down there. And we're going to take that place that's already lit on fire <coughs> and there's already torment and we're just going to take that and throw it over here in this other place of fire and torment. Does that make any sense? No. That's a physical thing. That's a place of fire. This is what it's talking about. Exactly. The lake of fire. Right? But if there's a hell as understood as many people understand. See, the Greeks have the, the Hades, you heard of Hades, like when we talk about Greek mythology and stuff, there's a place burning and burning and burning, okay? And that has come into Christianity. Now, some will tell you, no, there's still hell, and listen, we, we're not going to go here now because for the sake of time, but something to go and, and look at is the story of Lazarus. There's a parable, okay, a parable. Jesus taught in parables, yes? And there was a parable that he taught about Lazarus being dead, the other Lazarus, and being in a place of, of hell. And it said he looked up and he asked Abraham and everything. He's like, just give me a little bit of water, please. And then he's like, tell tell my brothers. And they said, no, 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 no. Your brothers have already heard it. Your brothers have already heard the same thing you heard. They heard Moses and the prophets. They didn't listen to it. Just like you didn't. You're over here. But it's a parable. Okay? It's not an actual event that, that is being described. But yet, go and read it. Go and read it. Because some folks will say, oh no, see, he's down there in hell. Here's Abraham, he's in heaven. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. But then why Saul down there too? Samuel, sorry. Why would Samuel be down there? Wouldn't he be up there with Abraham? Something to think about, yes? So anyway, so the reason that this stuff is coming up, right, obviously it's a hot topic between Christians, but... One of the things that people will say sometimes, I hear them say, oh, you know, this person's looking down on me, you know, and, and this person, you know, and oh, oh, I saw a ghost and it was my aunt and she said, she said no and she gave me some positive information. She said something really good to me and, it, and I know it was her. I know it was her, you know, and you have people that will pray to those that are, that are passed away. And I'm telling you, this is dangerous. This is a dangerous thing. Because when we're communicating, we're actually communicating with demons. According to the scriptures, the dead know nothing. They're in a state of sleep until the resurrection comes. So any form of being or anything like that that appears to us is not of God. Right? God, how are we to communicate with God? Does anybody know? Through prayer. Through who? Through Jesus Christ. That's how we are able to communicate to the Father directly is through Jesus Christ. Otherwise, there was a whole system of sacrificial stuff that needed to happen. And that was only temporary. It could only remove the sin temporary, that animal could. Jesus removes it, period. So every time we sin, 1 John 1, 9, we confess our sin, and we go to Jesus, we go directly to God, right? Say, man, I, I did this, God, I don't, you know what I mean? I don't want to live this way no more, I don't want to do these things no more. And we're confessing those sins and we're striving to get better and striving to improve our lives. That's the process of communicating to God. We're not to pray to any other gods, yes? So if someone died and we believe that they're floating around here, that's a form of God to us, no? So if we start praying, I'm praying to my aunt, Auntie Ethel, she passed away, I'm going to start praying Auntie Ethel. You know, in, in some of us, listen, we've lost mothers, we've lost fathers, I've, I've lost both. And sometimes when praying to God, I try to think of, like, get my head around God. And, and listen, the way that we do that is by going into the Bible, first off. But to understand God as a loving person, I might think of my dad and, like, maybe what my dad would have said. But I realize that it's God, right? So I need to, like, I hold on to it because God is my Father in heaven. So I need to remember that, like, the loving... God that I serve, right, is going to speak the, the things of love to me just as my earthly father, even better though. So I can have that thought in my mind but not be praying to my dad. Because my dad is asleep, according to the word of God. 
waiting to be resurrected. So we got to be careful not to be summoned to any kind of evil stuff around this family. All that paranormal, paranormal activity and all them shows you be watching and stuff, Ghostbuster stuff, they're chasing demons around. Hey, and, 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 and you know, some of us be like, no, it's a friendly ghost. You ever heard of that one? <laughs> yeah, it's a friendly ghost. We have a friendly ghost in our house. Yeah, yeah before we bought the house, someone died. There's friendly ghost rolls around, leaves doors open and stuff. There ain't no friendly ghost. That's the angel of light. That's the enemy. Satan doesn't show up with horns on his head. According to the scriptures, he shows up as a Christian. That's how, that's how Satan shows up. Talking about the Jesus Christ. And the ministers are doing the same thing. You know, professing Jesus Christ. They're snaked right in, man. Infidels. So they all, they all get together and say, Let's plant one of them, you know. They tell their crazy demon guy, hey, you go act like a nice guy in that house. You know, leave a door open once in a while. And that's what people, oh, the happy ghost came. Meanwhile, you're entertaining demons, right? You've got to be careful, man. You've got to be careful. But I'll tell you what, listen, when we're plugged into to Christ and Christ is living in us, we're protected from all that nonsense. There's powers and principalities and battles that are happening around us. And this will be our conclusion, right? But through the scriptures, we understand this, that there's things that are happening around us Spiritual warfare is going on outside of us right now. There's things that are happening that we can't see. You know when like a dog whistle gets blown and the dog freaks out and you're like, Why? You don't hear nothing. Right? Because you're not tuned into that frequency. We're not tuned into the frequency to see the spiritual world. But the Bible tells us there's a spiritual battle that is happening. Angels and demons are literally battling around us for, for our allegiance. That's what's happened. And that's according to the scripture. That's no joke. Remember we talked about Daniel before praying? It took three weeks for the angel Gabriel to get back to him. And, and Daniel kept praying and stayed faithful. And, and Gabriel came back and said, hey, listen, sorry it took me a while. I'm paraphrasing. He said, sorry it took me a while, but I got into a beef. I was heading back to you. Just left God. On his way back down to Daniel. And he got hemmed up. And started fighting with the Prince of Persia. He said, he was talking about Satan. And it got so bad that the archangel Michael had to come and back him up. That's how bad the beef was. Took three weeks. And he finally came back. Imagine, imagine the angel coming back, like in our carnal minds, we can see him coming back, like with a black eye and stuff. You know what I mean? And he's like, ah, but look. You see the other guy. Shows the knuckles, you know? But he's like, but here's the message, Daniel. This is what this is what God wants me to bring to you. So listen, when we're going through this stuff, you ever you ever feel that stuff around you though? Know? You ever feel when you're trying to do the right thing and there's some enemy stuff starts pulling you in different directions? And it's subtle a lot of the times too. But as we grow in the spirit, we start to identify that stuff. Little stuff pops up, all of a sudden someone messaged you, hasn't messaged you in a while, you're like, huh? You're like, that's craziness, right? But as we stay plugged in, listen, God starts sending us. We got we got the Holy Spirit and the angels operating around us too. Sometimes we'll be going through something, all of a sudden some random person says the most thing we never even thought they would even say. And we're like, whoa. We're like, wait a minute. I didn't just hear that by accident. You know, he jumped on some random meeting somewhere or something, and someone says something, you're like, I needed to hear that, you know. So listen, this stuff is operating around this family. So pray to God, pray to God directly through Jesus Christ. <coughs> Why don't we bow our heads in prayer? Our Heavenly Father God, Father, we thank you, Father, for this day. We thank you for your word, the Bible. God, I thank you for everyone who's in this room right now and, and anyone who's going to listen later on. And I just ask you, God, today to just give us rest, give us peace throughout this day. Give us the comfort, God, um, that comes only from you. Give us the strength to do your will. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Good job. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank